All right. <clears throat> well, uh, oh, welcome to uh, what is called, uh, yeah, come, come sit down in here, yeah. Uh, Mar Maryland Madness. Uh, uh, this is, um, it's a pleasure to be here, of course, and a little overwhelming, the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> fajita fest last night in which I hugged I don't know, a hundred people, which was uh, a rather, rather amazing, amazing time for me. Um, you can see now that uh, my byline is at the University of California at Riverside. And uh, this is what we call, at our age, an encore career. So I had a full 35 and a half years here at the Carnegie Institution. Then I went to, uh, we call it Moon Base UC Merced for, <laughs> for three, three and a half years, and, and uh, now I'm at uh, Riverside. Um, I uh, just accepted a position uh, as a, an endowed chair. I'm the Wilbur W. Mayhew uh, endowed chair of geoecology, and I've been working my entire career, and it was like, and my mother and father would go, what is it that you do? <laughs> and uh, so geoecology is, is what I do. Um, I'm starting a new institute. Uh, it had been created. I'm the first director of this institute. Uh, it's called the EDGE Institute in Environmental Dynamics and, and Geoecology. And my goal is to bring together uh, scientists, faculty, and students, and postdocs from um, I'm in the Earth Science Department, the Environmental Science Department, and bring in botanists and ecologists and evolutionary biologists to all work together on understanding the past, uh, understanding the present, and of course forecasting into the, uh, the future. And um, I'm pleased to be joining uh, a group of astrobiologists. Uh, Tim Lyons is my new colleague over there, as I have many colleagues. This is my new colleague over here. Uh, and getting back to uh, our astrobiology roots, which, which I have missed. Um, what I have on this slide is a uh, recently, uh, uh, I went with my family to uh, Yellowstone National Park, where it was my field area back in uh, 1981, 82, and 83. Uh, published a couple papers in there, and I look at those, and I was like, oh, God, they're very simple papers. but. Uh, it was it was a, a good time. So I'm not mad. I just uh, when I frown, it was like it means I'm just thinking. I didn't even say like she's she's mad. I was like when Maxine Singer, who was our former president, came and, and was greeting the geophysical laboratory, and I was sitting there and I was like she's like such a special person, and I was I was frowning like that. And, and, and she said, well, why is Marilyn frowning at me? And it was like, I'm not frowning, I'm thinking, anyway. <laughs> so uh, Seth may remember this was on our, our trip to Australia, one of them where we were collecting uh, wombat, wombat bones and teeth across, across the Australian landscape, and uh, we'll go into that later. So the geophysical lab, uh, Carnegie Institution, is, uh, I call it the mothership. And uh, uh, all of you have ties somehow through me, have either come through here, or, you know, from Merced and now at Riverside. And uh, I like this uh, picture over here. This was taken in the year, um, I think this is the pointer, yeah, the year 2000. Uh, there's Wes Huntress, who is uh, here today, uh, former director, um, Hatton S. Yoder. Uh, Charlie Pruitt, another former director, and, oops, wait, wait, back there, sorry. There he is, Director Cody on there. <laughs> Did you realize that, look at that, four of them all in a row. And this was, uh, yes, this is the year 2000, and where am I? I'm like over here. Point out uh, Matt Wooler over here when he had red hair. And uh, Matt McCarthy, uh, there's Diane O'Brien, uh, I think. Oh, there's Bjorn over there. You can see various people. Some of them, some of them are, are no longer with us. This was uh, back in the olden days at the old lab at 2801 Upton Street. And let's see, there's Luisa Fuentes on there, uh, Paige Chamberlain. And you can see I'm on the end. So the way it worked over here is 
the old people were in the middle, and then the younger people were on either end over there. And uh, you know, that's sort of the way it, it was. This was the picture, and uh, it must have been in 1990. There's Paul Koch, there's David Belinsky on there. You see Dave Mao over here. Here I am, somehow I've been moved <laughs> in here, even though there are older people on either side of me. I think they realize that like the fe only female, the second female ever to be hired here, was always at the end of the row. And it was like, it just looked a little un unusual over here. So uh, this is uh, a bit of a retrospective. And um, when you're, again, in your encore career, and you're thinking about, you know, what have you done in your life and what's been important and, um, you know, there are some things that are more important than others. And so I have a list and it's kind of a silly thing. Um, what's important? Discovering something new or redefining something that's known. I mean, this is what we all hope for in a career. Solving a problem or creating some new problems <laughs> to solve. Creating a new field or shaking up an existing one. Engaging young people and interacting with great peers. Just come in, just walk in. There's plenty of seats in the, in the front here. Earning a living. Uh, my professor, Pat Parker, uh, said he was like a down-home guy, you know, Parker. And he would say, Marilyn, he said, You'll be comfortable, but you'll never be rich. That was his, that was his uh, phrase. We have the ability to enrich our mind every day for our entire career. This is something that is so rare for, for other people. And the last thing, is, which is one of the most important, is having a lot of fun while working hard. So uh, one of my things in coming to Merced was it was, it's a bit of a dour place, would you say? I'm looking at my colleagues, so all my graduate students are here. And, uh, and after a while, in speaking to someone, they said, do you realize you used the word fun six times in the last hour? And it was like, yes, that's uh, exactly the way it should be. So uh, I'm going to give some examples of this. Discovering something new or redefining something known. Uh, this is, uh, of course, this is me over here. And this is Andrew Steele, Steely over there. This was his first field trip that we ever took him out to the, to the eastern shore, gave him a fish net. He went out there in some uh, sandals, and the first time he came back, his shoe was lost in the, in the river over there. He <laughs> never got back. Yeah, uh, that was, uh, I said, the summer of 2005. Is that about when you came to the lab? Uh, 2001. That, that was summer 2002. Oh, 2001. Okay, I was I was off a little bit. Uh, here's another another favorite scene. Do you remember this one? This is with Matt Buller, and um, <clears throat> we were in a place that we called the Blonde Pond. And uh, you can see, obviously, is there a theme here? I think I have the same shorts on. I was like <laughs> I was like always out in a swamp looking for something wet. It was where I, obviously where I was happiest. And we were out there collecting mangrove leaves in a project that was like, don't worry, we'll have this one, uh, we will have this one wrapped up in, in a very short period of time. And it had rained. The reason why it was called Blonde Pond is at that time, was before I had gray hair, I, I put some of that highlighter stuff, I sprayed it in my hair, and I thought oh, I was going out in the sun, and then it rained. And I said, well, Kiss ruining my hairstyle out here. <laughs> so after years of doing that, we uh, we made some some. Oh, we just had a great time. It was a five six year project where we worked on this, and we uh, discovered that uh, microbes living in sediment were fixing nitrogen from the air, and there was an excess of ammonia that that bubbled up uh, the leaves of the mangrove trees took that up and it was a huge isotope fractionation. So this was kinetic isotopes, it was ecology, it was mangrove science, um, all sorts of things and uh, we had a good time with that. Solving a problem or creating a new problem to solve. 
What I'm wearing over here is uh, what is called the pig hat. And Sue, Sue Ziegler will know about the pig hat. So former postdoc uh, Jane Scott, who uh, passed away a, a few years ago, went down to visit Sue, uh, Sue Ziegler at Arkansas, and he brought me back this pig hat. And uh, here's Seth wearing the pig hat over here. That's a, I always show that picture over here. Whenever your mass spectrometer is broken and you can't figure out how to fix it, on goes the pig hat, doesn't it? And it channels, it channels energy in there. And you are always able to, our, our machines work usually, that's what we said. So we still, we still keep that pig hat. My husband doesn't like it, but anyway. Uh, and then there are um, looking at problems over long periods of time. So on here, that's me over here. This is Gift Miller. Uh, that's Bev Johnson, and this is my son, Evan, who was leading the karaoke last <laughs> night. Uh, he was about three over there, and we were in uh, Australia. We started this project in the, in the early 1990s, and on last Monday, a week ago, we submitted our, how many proposals have we submitted to, to a, lot. a lot to do this work? Uh, we made many trips uh, to Australia along the way. Uh, here I am over here, uh, Gif, this is Gif over here, uh, Chris Florian over here, uh, looking through uh, and collecting bits of uh, fossil eggshells. And this was just published <coughs> uh, this year in 2016. We made uh, 3,500 measurements of uh, isotope ratios of fossil eggshells. And it was all published, fine. I was like, almost every isotope ratio was in there. And what you can see on here, this is um, age and years. So we have a record going back 130,000 years. And what you can see over here is right at this, this window over here, we call this the extinction window, in which um, humans came to Australia in a, in a very short period of time all the megafauna went extinct um, on, the, uh, <coughs> on the continent over here. And then the carbon isotopes, what we call collapsed, and we had an ecosystem collapse. So this is an example of how uh, we have the ability to work on projects for a long period of time. Uh, shaking up an established field, so this is Noreen Touros over here, and of course me, and we're smiling. We were at the vacuum line. Do you remember in the days of the vacuum line when you had to crack things open? It was like some of the older people are going yes, and the other ones are going what? You know, you lay things in a boat. So uh, <clears throat> what uh, Noreen came up with this idea over here, and this was the the uh, nursing. Uh, you are what you eat, and nitrogen isotopes plus three per mil, roughly. And these are fingernail data. This is my fingernails over here, and this is my daughter's fingernails. And it turns out that when you're nursing your child, your child is one trophic level above where you are, and that as your child is weaned, their values uh, decrease and then become the same as the adult population. Uh, we did this, we collected fingernails from, from people all over, all over the place. This paper, uh, which was published in the <coughs> Carnegie Institution annual report, uh, we sent it to science and they said, man, not of any interest to them. Even though they published a photograph of Noreen and I doing something about this. <laughs> then we sent it to the Journal of Physical Anthropology and I, I was like cleaning out my stuff to move to Riverside and I read these reviews and one snotty person said, Ah, there's nothing to this. This is this is this is not anything. And we ended up publishing it like in random pieces. That Geophysical Lab uh, annual report is cited by hundreds of people. This has been seen. Seth's found this in whales. People have found it in all sorts of other animals. This is an effect that um, has uh, been shown and documented in in all sorts of things. Uh, creating a new field. Uh, Astrobiology, uh, it was a privilege to be here. We had an astrobiology program at the Geophysical Lab for 15 years. Uh, there's 
Dina over there and Verena and Jim Cleves and I forgot who this guy is and I had to work with uh, Hiroshi Omoto and it was like that was Shuhei's professor and if you know Hiroshi Omoto he's not easy to work with uh, but anyway we we managed to uh, write a proposal and hold a field trip where we took everybody up to up to uh, northern Canada and all looked at uh, banded iron formations and did Shuhei, did you give a, a talk on the outcrop when you were there? Uh, yeah, about the banding iron. Yes, 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 and so there was an argument and um, <laughs> uh, uh, what was his name? Dick Holland. Yeah. Dick Holland yeah. was out there and he had a bullhorn and he was talking, and then Hiroshi Omoto got a bullhorn, and we said, okay, the agreement was, you can't just push your agenda over there, because I would snatch the bullhorn away. But everybody behaved. So starting uh, creating a new field. Um, this is our, our astrobiology team on the, uh, the Amaze expedition. Uh, there's Jen Eigenbrode and Verena and Maya Schweitzer and, and Garrett Huntress, who is here, Steely. Um, uh, Torbian, and, and there I am. So what are we doing with all those guns? We firmly believe in the Second Amendment. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. So also in solving a problem. Uh, so you have an isotope lab and you know what you're doing and yeah, I'm kind of interested in what foxes are eating and what, how plants are growing and things like that. But uh, with Andrew Steele, it was uh, organic matter in uh, Martian meteorites. And Roxanne uh, will recognize this data over here. This is from DAG 476. So when you work with meteorites, you know, they have all these weird names like DAG 476, ALH 84001, you know, blah, 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 blah. As a biologist, you don't get too excited, but everyone else is like, do one some dang force. <laughs> so, so Roxanne and I would get it in like a little scraping and a vial. And it was like, is this all you can give us? And look at these amounts. This is the amount of micrograms of carbon that we were measuring. So Roxanne would go in and clean absolutely everything. We learned where our carbon contamination was hands down. And and then you had to, not only you analyzed it, you know, weighed it, analyzed it, and then you would take it and you would, uh, you, we would acidify it, and then we would muffle it at 500 degrees centigrade to get rid of any terrestrial contamination, and this is, this is what is left. This is your extraterrestrial carbon, and steel, you would go, can't you get the nitrogen isotope? <laughs> I was like, give us more sample, we'll give you the nitrogen isotopes. Uh, engaging young people. Uh, this is uh, Colin Black, who was, uh, he was a uh, University of Connecticut uh, undergraduate, and uh, he was uh, assigned to go to the San Diego Museum of Natural History, where, where he picked up a, a dried bat over there. So uh, George mentioned that uh, uh, Chris and I have um, made a donation to the uh, Carnegie Institution of Washington, and um, uh, it, it, I've saved my money for my entire life, and um, well, it's time to spend some, let's put it that way. <laughs> so um, we thought about this, and uh, over the years, uh, we've had uh, Evan, who is leading the karaoke over here, was worked in the lab as a high school student and Doug had to mentor him. George's children have worked there, Bjorn's kids. I mean, not only do we employ our own kids, we'll employ <laughs> your kids <laughs> uh, But people came in. We had high schools from all around uh, the, the uh, area. Uh, kids would come in and um, uh, it, it, changed their, it changed the way they thought about things. And there was never enough, there was never a pot of money really to, to pay them. It was always, you know, $500 or $1,000 here and there. So um, we're hoping that this uh, endowed fund um, will provide opportunities for really young people, like, you know, 15, 16 years old, 
who just are interested. Jake Wolbauer was one of our yes. We took him took him down to Florida, out into the into the swamp over there. That was a good trip, wasn't it? That was you there further out. <laughs> um, and this is a, another picture. The ability to have young people in at this age lets them determine. Not everybody ends up as a, as a scientist, but they have the opportunity to discover, you know, what is it about a science, you know, in high school, if you remember that, it's like, it can be deadly boring, you know, you're in there memorizing the Green Yard reaction in organic chemistry or some, some arcane thing like that. Um, we also, <coughs> this is Brendan O'Connor, um, and then I, I feel, look at this picture, there's Doug and Karen, you see yourselves on there. Uh, we had a, uh, and Jen, I, this was our fancy dress party. Do you remember we had that party where you had to wear a tuxedo and an evening gown? And uh, we had Brendan there as, as the bartender, he, which he actually made, is making a career out of it today. <laughs> uh, when I got to uh, UC Merced, uh, here's Joy McDermott. Joy is in the audience over here today, and, and Isabel Lawrence. Um, when you're at a university, <clears throat> and now they've gone from, you can see, this is like the mothership ivory tower here, to we actually have a tower out there, right? <laughs> um, and you get to a university, education is like, that's your mission. You know, what is your mission? And I would go, the mission of the university is research and education. You know, like every time some administrator would pull your chain, oh, we need to do this, and you say, well, I'd like to whole the mission of the university. <laughs> um, there, it's easy to attract undergraduates to come and work in, in, your, uh, in your laboratory. Um, it, it has been a lot of fun for me, being at UC Merced, to meet people of all different types, people who have, who have not come from families. I'll say, so, are you, your parents uh, scientists? And then they'll go, no, you know, my, my dad works in the field, or my father has an almond farm, or, you know, something like that. So um, it really is uh, uh, one of the good things about going to a university from here is the ability to interact with uh, more young people. And then on your lifetime career, of course, there are your great peers. This is one of my favorite pictures. Here's Steely, and there's George with their laptops. Uh, dueling laptops, he had the bigger one here. He had this <laughs> one. He just looked at. So the thing is that when you start your career, uh, Steely came in here working with microbes and me, and George came here and he was a coal chemist, essentially. And now, like, they're into meteorites and weird materials and things over here. And, and the point of that being is you, you start your career with certain people and then as they go through over time, their ideas that they have uh, are, they just, they morph and they change. And it's a marvelous thing as a scientist, actually, to be around um, people who have the ability to change over there. Uh, in the room over there, so there you can see Kate Freeman and I, and that was in France a few years ago, uh, women in organic geochemistry. So. Uh, there are many women in organic geochemistry here. Like last night we were saying, God forbid anything should happen because many of the women in organic geochemistry are, are at the meeting over here. <laughs> and it's a field, it's a traditionally, traditionally kind of European oil company, little sedentary field of people. And uh, recently, uh, a few years ago, I received the... Uh, Alfred Tribes Medal in Organic Geochemistry. I was the first woman in the history of this um, honor to get, to get the medal. And it was like, this is a big deal. And it was like, what, Marilyn? It was like, <laughs> so there was like the old men of the society who now would come over and have a glass of wine. Marilyn, how's it going? <laughs> um, and I have to say that, so here's Kate on here. I have been nominating, I'll tell you, right in front of a hundred people, <laughs> nominating you for the same award for at least ten years or so. And she hasn't gotten it yet, and I said, her time will come. <laughs> <laughs> 
And it was like, okay. <laughs> so Kate Freeman first came to us because her dad, Dave Freeman, uh, was a colleague of Tom Herring's, and Dave Freeman shared an office with me. It was back when uh, no one wanted to sit in a lab with a, with a female, so they put visiting chemist in there, and he sat next to me, and he was reviewing his career, and he said, Marilyn, he said, have you ever listed your top five most important papers? And I said, yeah, and I, I only had five papers. <laughs> And uh, Kate came and she washed glassware for a summer and it was Tom Herring said you need to go and work with John Hayes. And then she, uh, I'll say you invented with some others, the uh, gas chromatograph combustion system that many of us uh, use today. And it was in 2014 with Heather Graham over there that we finally published a paper together. Uh, their data is from uh, STRI, the Panama Smithsonian Lab, and this was uh, data that I generated um, from the, uh, <coughs> the lab in um, Edgewater, Maryland with uh, Jess, Jess Parker. Um, and just to show you that, having fun. This is our picture of babes that we were called the babes of science. <laughs> and uh, uh, there we were, we were in the, uh, we were on a glacier, we had just taken a core. Uh, again, I have uh, a rifle over there. It amazes me, now you look at me, I have a walker, right, and a cane, kind of doddering around. I, I was like the safety person <laughs> that, that, that was entrusted with a high-powered rifle to kill polar bears, which, which I think is, I, that was because I was the person you know, when you're a mother, it was like a lot of mothers in the room, something is attacking your child, you're going you're gonna to stop them right over there. Yeah, so uh, anyway, there we were. Um, let's see, there's Pan right there, uh, Liana Benning, and there's uh, uh, Jen Eigenbro. Having fun while working hard. Uh, Derek and Dave will remember, remember this day well. Yes, we were the rapid response mangrove team. <laughs> You, you, I think you've been on this one too, Matt. We brought our boat in over here. We had an inner tube. And the plot was to go through this mangrove channel and sample mangrove leaves throughout the channel. But how you can't go, you couldn't get a boat into there. So the way it worked was I sat in the inner tube and it was tethered to Dave Baker. <laughs> who snorkeled, who snorkeled through and it was like, stop. <laughs> I'd pick off a leaf over there. It was it was a good day, wasn't it? <laughs> so uh, when I come to and you think about your career, and you come and you notice on that list was not getting large sums of grant money or publishing a million papers. So it comes down to this question of publish or perish. Now obviously, you want, you want to get ahead in the world, you have to publish papers. And we've all, you know, we publish papers. But, you know, there's, there's much more to the fabrication of a scientist and the way they think of things than just doing a study and um, publishing a paper. And this is a study where, I said with Matt Wooler, we went out in the, the uh, circles and the ellipses over here. <coughs> Where the isotope values of primary producers, red mangrove leaves, uh, sea grasses, um, mats, and then all of the dots and everything on here are um, animals that we surveyed in the same ecosystem. And you look at this, this is an amazing range of nitrogen isotopes going from minus 18 per mil, uh, delta values up to uh, over here plus 7 and quite a range in carbon isotope ratios. This we have not published, right? No, so, so what is with this? Here's another example over here. Um, we had, uh, I, I became a melon fellow of the Smithsonian, and um, we had a study looking at the effect of chicken waste on the uh, pollution of the eastern shore. There were big blooms of noxious uh, algae that were out there. They were causing fish kills, people were getting sick. 
So we went out there, kind of incognito, weren't we? And I dressed up in pink, <laughs> and I went behind. People say, are you on the way to the beach? And it was like, oh yeah, did we get lost on the way to the beach? <laughs> uh, Matt was in there as a British botanist. He put on a thick British accent. Yes, just a visiting botanist from, from England. <laughs> and uh, this was Quinn Roberts, who we called a college student. We would send her in to various places to steal chicken shit from people. <laughs> And she, she asked, remember when she had to get a chicken? She said she couldn't graduate from college until she had gotten a chicken. Um, and we put together this uh, piece of work here. Here are all the various parts and pieces to the story. We measured the isotope ratio. But this took actually took years. And all of these uh, people were involved in this. So although it's not published, we did give many presentations, we gave talks on this, we trained a lot of students, we challenged all the people growing um, chickens out there, and we uh, tested a theory. So it turns out that birds, uh, their excretionary product is uric acid. Uh, mammals excrete urea, you all excrete urea, okay? Birds excrete uric acid, which is, urea is a very simple molecule, uric acid is a a two ring molecule. So our first thing was we were going to go out and find uric acid out in the environment that came from chicken waste. And remember our experiment of we bought like thousands of dollars of labeled uric acid and we dripped it into a creek. And then we started looking for it. We had an assay for it, couldn't find it. <coughs> Turns out that microbes convert uric acid to ammonia in like an hour. So it was like one of those. So what we had to do, we finally did find it. We had a portable lab in the back of my car. We drove out there in winter time when it was cold, and we found a hint of uric acid. Maybe not a perfect study, but nonetheless, something um, that impacted other things. Um, going to uh, UC Merced, I call it Moon Base UC Merced. It was like kind of an outpost over there. So this is uh, work that was from all of our labs team, uh, Daniel Taves, who is here, did the plotting of GIS. This is the uh, isotope ratio of soil um, ammonia relative to the grasses that are growing on the vernal pools reser reserve. So I got to Merced, and I didn't have anything in there but a, a balance. Actually, we had to borrow the balance. And I brought my old spectrophotometer from here, like an old portable one that I bought with the Smithsonian money, and Bobby Nakamoto, who was here, is like, Bobby's like our ammonia nitrate measurer. And finally, and the, and the, the thing here is that you got to take advantage of the situation that you have. If you always think that whatever you're going to do in science has to end up in a published paper, you probably will never go through that uh, period of discovery, which I, I think is, is really important. Uh, and there's, a, uh, there's Seth and colleague uh, Gary Graves from the Smithsonian. And the question comes down to it, will we ever have the time to publish everything that we do? And it was like, we have generated a lot of data. And this was taken in the uh, Santilla Creek watershed in uh, 2013. And over the years, we've measured um, <coughs> hundreds of black-throated blue warbler feathers. And what you can see on here are the hydrogen isotopes on this axis. Uh, 12 years of birds that were collected <laughs> in one watershed over here. And looking at this variation in here, people, people use hydrogen isotope ratios in bird feathers to study migration and whether um, animal populations return to the same place that they um, were born and originated and came back. And what you can see is, there is variation over time and whether that's uh, due to climate or not. But um, this is definitely a study where we have thousands of hydrogen ice, and it was like, ah, you got to get this published. But you know, sometimes you don't have the time for that. Uh, Seth will recognize this one. And everyone will say for Tom Herring, who is my mentor in college, he would come in here and he, he said, what are you doing in here? And we're saying we're running 100 you know, feathers or something. He'd snarl and he'd say, 
pick five well-chosen samples. <laughs> it was always five well-chosen samples, wasn't it? Yes, so anyway, so Seth and I uh, measured, now this is uh, Delta O18 in organic matter, and everything from Australian insects down to Belize fish over here. Um, what to do with this stuff? This was something where you're discovering something new. We know we're on to something. Uh, is it a complete study? No, it's not a complete study. But somebody could look at that and say, oh, there's some you know, really rich things uh, for, for people to look at. And the thing is that curiosity, which is the hallmark of a good scientist, leads to innovation. And innovation is exactly what um, scientists actually want, and eventually publication. So this is a graph that Seth made recently. It will be published. Um, uh, these are various amino acids, and he has a novel way of estimating the contribution that the microbes that live in the guts of living organisms actually make to the metabolism of animals. And it's a really, it's a very important finding. These are all amino acids that we would call essential amino acids, ones that you have to have in your diet. And what this shows is that for, in the case of valine, for example, um, 60 to 70 percent of that is coming from the bacteria that live in your guts. This is, uh, if you're into health research, the gut microbiome, big stuff. Everyone is into this. This determines all sorts of illnesses you have. If you're an ecologist, this determines how um, herbivores, big herbivores like elephants, can live on a, on a landscape eating a bunch of grass all the time. And this is um, something that you know, we're definitely pursuing. So we're getting to the end <laughs> of the thing. You remember that day? <laughs> that was taken in Belize. Derek's laughing over there. So this is for the young people over here. Be the captain of your ship. Um, if you have to look back and learn over, over there, if I had followed the advice of everybody, you know, just stay the course, do the same thing, was like, psh, I wouldn't have had near the career that I've had. So be the captain of your ship. This was a, this was a time we, we went in Belize, and Dave Baker and Chris Freeman were the divers so they're out there collecting corals, and Derek and I were left as the captains of the ship. And uh, in one instance, the divers thought they'd secured the anchor. And uh, we look over there, and we were out snorkeling, and we realized our boat was heading to Honduras. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, quick got back in there, and it was like, yes, that was a good one. What else happened? Oh, there was the uh, signal flag that was supposed to go up, you know, and divers are down, like they sent up a signal flag. And Derek and I are out in the waves over there. There's the <laughs> reef over there in the waves. And it was like, we're afraid the boat's going to tip over. And we're waiting for that hot dog to appear. And it was like, turns out he, he let go of it, right? And it was like, he drifted to Honduras. <laughs> <laughs> so here's just some, some silly words of advice over here. Curiosity will not kill the cat. <laughs> it just won't. Being a curious person, acting on your curiosity, uh, it may not end up in a science paper, but you will um, learn something along the way. Uh, do it now. Don't wait. Um, I, I'm at a point in my life where I'm limited in my mobility and, and what I can do. And it was like, and thank goodness, I didn't wait to do all these things. I traveled the world and saw everything. Of course, have fun. We went through that one. Don't take yourself too seriously. Um, that's that's a, a good one to think about. You know, when you're in the field of uh, science and you have to act scholarly pretty much of the time and you have to write and present yourself. And now that I'm in a university, it's even more like, okay, you're, you're expected to take yourself and stand up to injustice. This is something for the older folks out there. We were talking, now that you're full professors, it's your job to stand up for your students, your postdocs, and the assistant professors that are under your wing. You've been brought up to this, and now it's, now it's your, your turn. 
Uh, don't let the big wigs push you around. Sorry, Matt, unless I'm not letting you push us around over here. Um, and last of all, listen to your husband, your wife, or your partner over there. That's that was over there. And uh, um, uh, this is the end here. So I, um, um, I again, um, I'm forced to uh, uh, think about my whole career. As, as you know, I, I have been diagnosed with. Um, ALS, and um, I, I don't know what my future is, is going to be, but I, I know where I've been, and I know I can see where I, I have the time left to go where I want to go, and you know, we are very privileged people to be scientists and, and have a career in this, and so even when your grants been turned down, you know, reviewers of your paper say, you know, you're an idiot, you don't know how to write. <laughs> Uh, the dean comes down and the dean says, you know, get out of your lab and throwing you out. You know, you get rejected from a job offer <laughs> over there. And it's like you have to think of the whole big picture that um, uh, it, it is a, a, a really a privilege to do this. And if you think about it, um, I think everyone can have a very successful career. Um, in the way that the, the way that you've chosen, which is coming back to Captain and Chip, and that's it. Thank you.